attitudes are very strong indicators of our opinions and thoughts, of our feelings, and of our linguistic behaviors. Studying languages within the sociocultural, the sociolinguistic context is really an efficient way of telling us and explaining the language behavior as well as predicting language change. But how often do we really think of our language attitudes? How do we, as speakers, perceive our own linguistic choices and those linguistic choices of others? And also, what factors would influence our preferences for one language variety over another? Today, I will answer all of these questions and I will make specific reference to Arabic. So um, let's start first by the concept of attitude. So what is attitude? Uh, researchers define it as a, so as a psychological variable which has three main components. The affective component, which concerns the speaker's feelings about language. They like it, they hate it, and about the speakers of the language. We also have the cognitive <laughs> component, <laughs> which basically are the facts and knowledge about a language. And finally, we have the behavioral component, which is the action or basically readiness to act. So before I talk about um, language attitudes towards Arabic, I would like to start with English. And um, let me ask you this. Uh, we'll do this by show of hands. Let's see if, if I can really see anyone. <laughs> uh, how many of you think of this? as good English. Okay, yes, yeah, good, thank you. And how many of you think of this as good English? Okay, good, I see more consensus in this room as to the second one being an example of good English. But why is that? Because basically we inherit our attitudes as members within a speech community. So we do have a collective attitude. So let's turn to the Arabic context, the sociolinguistic realities of the Arab world. Arab speakers use two languages, classical Arabic and vernacular Arabic. What do I mean by this? So speakers in every single Arab country has their own vernacular with its own distinctive features that differ from other dialects or spoken uh, parts with certain linguistic features. But all Arabs use classical Arabic as the language of unity. And so to describe the relationship between classical Arabic and vernacular Arabics, if I may say, then um, we refer to a sociolinguistic situation called diglossia. And by diglossia, we refer to coexistence of two languages or two language varieties. One, in this case, the classical Arabic being the high variety. It's the formal. It's the highly codified, grammatically more complex. It's specifically used for very, very formal situations like political speeches, like religious sermons, and it is the language of writing. Whereas vernacular Arabic is basically the low variety, the informal variety, the uh, dialect that is spoken by most population, and most importantly, it is not used for writing. And so in the minds of Arabs, they do believe strongly that the two varieties are so distinctly apart, phonologically, morphologically, and syntactically, that they can never meet. <laughs> except in our imagination. And so why do we have that great respect for classical Arabic? Why is it the high, the revered variety? Well, in the minds of Arabs, there are many reasons. So ideologically speaking, classical Arabic is the language of unity. It's an expression of Arab identity. Historically speaking, it's the symbol of civilization. 
And linguistically, of course, it's the most beautiful, the most eloquent, and hence the name Fusha. And functionally, it is the language of education and the language of formal communication. Most importantly, that combines Arabs to other groups. And for religious reasons, it's basically, it is the language of the most sacred texts, which is the Quran. So because of this, again, the two varieties can never meet, except in our imagination. My research indicates otherwise. So in my research, I asked my respondents, Arabic speakers, about their attitudes and feelings about the vernacular Arabic, in this case, Jordanian Arabic. Overwhelming majority said they had favorable, effective attitudes towards spoken. But when I asked them about their beliefs and whether they think that vernacular Arabic is more important than classical Arabic, overwhelming majority had an unfavorable cognitive attitude. And as we can not notice, there's a lack of harmony between speakers' emotions on the one hand and speaker attitudes and beliefs on the other hand. We can also notice speakers' uncertainty about their attitudes as well. We sociolinguists like to think of this as a predictor of change. And another question I asked my respondents about the perception of other speakers who use classical Arabic and whether they are loyal or detached from their community. Again, speakers or respondents had majority of their respondents being favorable cognitively to classical Arabic because they said the speakers are more loyal to the language and also closer and not detached from their own communities. But when I asked speakers about the dialect they use or the variety they use at work, again, there was this favorable, positive feeling towards using vernacular into daily life communication. And so again here we see a discrepancy or a mismatch between speakers' beliefs and on the one hand and speakers' behavior on the other hand. Again, we'd like to think of this as a prediction of change. And so the result is the clear cut line that separated classical Arabic from vernacular Arabic that existed for a very, very long time is becoming a little blurry. So attitudes are slightly changing, speakers' behavior is slightly changing, and the change is undergoing its way. It's happening sooner or later. With that, I would like to conclude that by examining the language attitudes and complexities of language attitude, I do think we can predict language change. And it needs to be embraced and accepted, even though it might cause some confusion or dissatisfaction or uncertainty along the way, but it has to be accepted as a natural language development for living languages. And so next time, when you observe a change in language or in a speaker's linguistic behavior, I invite you to enjoy that change, to embrace it, and not judge it negatively, because as Shakespeare once said, there's nothing, either bad or wrong, but thinking makes it so. Thank you.